What is up, YouTube? Welcome back to the Cutlass Board Games channel. I am Keith, longtime player and storyteller of Blood on the Clock Tower. And after a Twitter thread that I was reading through yesterday, I realized that some people have really not had the best possible exposure to Blood on the Clock Tower. And I wanted to quickly give five tips as to how to ensure that your first game of Blood on the Clock Tower is going to be a good one. Now, on Twitter, the person in particular said that on average, their games of Blood on the Clock Tower went for three to four hours, and I thought that was lunacy. And it made me think that perhaps you should be focusing on trying to curate what your experience would be in the same way that you want to have a good DM for Dungeons and Dragons. And so I put together these five tips to help you make sure that you're giving yourself the best first chance at playing Blood on the Clock Tower. Now, the first tip I have is, and this is one I especially think is relevant to me, but don't play at conventions. At conventions, while I have had fun times playing at events like that, in Australia, most of our conventions don't pull that many people. You'll see me... PAX gets a couple of thousand people, but literally every other thing is like less than 200. So even at the most packed that one of the side conventions would be that I had been going to, it really can't be that noisy. If you're playing somewhere that's way more crowded, like the United States or in parts of Europe, um, then there's a pretty good chance that it's going to be way more packed and it's going to be really noisy and it's going to be difficult to focus on what's going on. Also, I've both seen and heard uh, many reports of um, storytellers at conventions running games of up to 20 players um, because they just won't say no to extra players coming into running a game, uh, which is absolutely crazy to me, and I would literally never do that. I never want to run a game, personally, that has more than 13 people. Um, 13 people, you would have to, like, coerce me into it. 15 would be at gunpoint. There's no way I'm doing anything like that. Um, there's way too many things to track, and especially if it's a first-person's game. It's like, are you, are you going to remember 14 other people's names for the first time? you are not going to be able to play Blood on the Clock Tower, a good first game with 15 or more other players. That is ridiculous to me. Um, my first Blood on the Clock Tower experience was with, um, I want to say somewhere between 11 and 13, and I didn't interact with four of the players. I didn't interact with my own demon, even though I was a minion. But it was in a nice enclosed garage space so that if those people were talking or they had the spotlight during something like uh, nominations and executions, you could hear what was going on, you could hear what they were saying, and you were still able to piece together the narrative without having to talk to every single person. And I think that a setting like that is going to be way, way better than a big crowded convention. People are yelling at each other, you can barely hear what's going on. You want to be able to, able to listen, able to understand and solve the puzzle of the game without feeling like you're overwhelmed by so much other stuff going on. Now, there is a lot of little small meetup type events that do run games regularly, and I would recommend finding them and going and playing at them rather than seeking out something at the really big conventions. Number two, this is a big one for me. Say no to any play count above 11. I think 10 is the best play count because that is when you get two minions. Uh, they add an extra minion in for the balancing. Um, 11 is two minions, one outsider, and that's really as high as I ever want to go. Anything longer than that, and you guarantee that the game is going to go for longer than an hour, and I personally get grumpy if a game, any game, literally any game goes for longer than an hour. It's like, why haven't you, why haven't you finished this yet? Why haven't you won this yet? And unless if the storyteller is really punchy, really fast night phase, really on their feet as to what's going on and hurting the cats that are the players to get the nominations and executions through it's going to drag and it's going to suck when it's your first game and you're playing you want to have the least number of other players information that you have to keep track of so it isn't as overwhelming you want to be able to put an entire worldview together where you can see what everyone's doing and how their information interacts with each other without having to keep track of too many things it's like imagine um, you're teaching your great-grandmother how to use a computer and you start off with Google Chrome with 16 tabs open and you like blitz through them really quickly trying to show off what all these different websites and stuff are. You're like, this is Google, this is YouTube. They can be lost straight away. It's the same kind of thing. Um, I personally don't do it because I know that it means the game will drag, but 
making it easier for yourself in what is actually in the game um, is not a bad idea. The next one is um, play Trouble Brewing at least 10 times before trying other scripts. That means if someone goes, hey, do you want to play Sex and Violets or Bad Moon Rising as your first game? You say, no, thank you. I would like to play the introductory script Trouble Brewing. Um, and me as a long time player, I very, very rarely want to play Bad Moon Rising. Um, Sex and Violets, I pretty much only ever want to play after I have already played Trouble Brewing. Um, and my preference to playing any particular script is pretty much always Trouble Brewing because Trouble Brewing has the least bad games. Um, like it's the most consistent, whereas Sex and Violet, sometimes stuff will happen, you just have no idea what's going on, and Bad Moon Rising is even worse for that, because it's harder to know what's going on. Um, and sometimes that can be the fun of it, but sometimes when you just want to solve the puzzle, you want to have the ability to know what's going on. Me, again, personally. So, make sure that your first, your first game is Trouble Brewing, because you don't want it to already be more complicated than it needs to be. Next up. You can just read the rules in advance. You can watch a YouTube tutorial video in advance. You can have a look at the big character sheet in advance. A lot of this stuff is all available online. YouTube has tons of tutorial type content on there already from a lot of rabid fans that have created stuff about the game and it is really helpful. Um, I would recommend looking at a lot of this stuff and reading it through and getting a general understanding of what's going on um, before actually playing a game because a lot of the time what will happen, especially if you're in a scenario like a convention or a meetup group where they have to explain the rules several times a day, they um, have new people coming in and out all the time, what they're gonna do is they're gonna teach you how to play the game in one minute. They're gonna go, these are the four rules. You're like, okay, um, this is how nominations and executions works as it's happening. You're like, okay, and all this kind of stuff. They like really bombard you with how the game works as fast as possible. And for some people, that, that can be really hard to, to gather it. Um, and when they go, did you understand? Do you have any questions? You also feel obligated to say, no, I fully understand. Please let the game run. Everyone is staring at me. I, I don't want to hold everyone up. Um, and that can be kind of stressful. Um, so seeing some of that stuff in advance, and then even if you're like, yeah, can you quickly teach me the rules? And you've seen all this stuff already, they're going to quickly refresh you on what's going on. And you're going to like not be struggling to what, what's happening. But... They just explain the rules to you. Let's pretend you fully understood everything. They then hand you a character sheet that has 24 items on it, and people are going to quiz you on it immediately. They're like, hey, which one of these are you? And you're like, I haven't even looked at them. My one was blue. And they're like, okay, uh, which one? And you're like, ah, <laughs> like, there's 24 items on there. Um, like a lot of this, this five tips is going to be about reducing your mental load and the number of things that you have to remember off the bat. If you're going to struggle to remember 15 people's names, how are you going to remember a character sheet that's got 25 different characters on it you've never seen before? So I do recommend going in, having a look, reading through a lot of this stuff, taking your time, getting an idea of what's going on, and then going, okay, I'm ready to play my first game. I think I know what all the trouble brewing characters do. I've seen some tips and tricks. I've seen some how to play stuff. I have some understanding of how the storyteller will function while they're running the game. And like that isn't like uh, such a ridiculous thing because it will help you feel more confident in what you're doing ab about stuff if you are uh, put on a spot where you need to lie about something or you feel like you have to bluff about something you'll feel more confident about what you're doing because you know more of what your options could be and i think that would help take some of the stress out of it um that was number four and then number five um one of the rules of the game is like have fun um be graceful in winning and in losing and all this kind of stuff but uh, what I think is important is uh, allow yourself to make mistakes uh, and forgive yourself for them even if other people do not. I've played plenty of salty games. I've played games of people I will never talk to again. Um, I've played really angry games that I've hated. I've played games that other people... Like, I've run games other people have hated and have, like, abused me and yelled at me for it. Um, and, like, that can happen in any social situation. Like, I've played League of Legends people can just be cranky like it's it's not your fault in particular you're allowed to take the time to figure out what's going on you're not expected to be an expert straight away most people won't expect you to be an expert straight away and you're allowed to make mistakes as you're figuring stuff out like that's fine <laughs> like you need to give yourself permission to fail because if you don't fail you're not going to learn how to play and if you're not going to learn how to play any good then can you really have fun 
playing it if you don't know if you're not if you're just kind of being a tourist in there standing there watching and listening to everyone not really knowing what's going on so i think for you to have the best possible chance at really really enjoying this game and i have really really enjoyed this game i've played easily more than a thousand games i don't think i could make a more accurate estimate than that but a lot um and i've really enjoyed it it's probably my most played board game of all time um and i really didn't want other people to have the same experience as this particular twitter user who came in and just like that one line of text that they put down that my average game was three to four hours and they played multiple times that would kill me i would hate that so much so i can understand why they thought that the game wasn't great you need you need a, a punchy storyteller that knows what they're doing you need a not super overloaded game that's in the middle of the night everyone's grumpy and cranky it's hour 16 or an hour 48 of a convention or something ridiculous right like me personally there's maybe five storytellers in the world that I trust without a doubt to run a good game that I, I know I won't hate, right? Five people, okay? Like, that on its own is crazy to me, and the level of skill that it takes to be a good storyteller is really high, right? Um, so you just... I think that you want to put yourself in a situation where you can have your best possible chance at a first game, and then... You can maybe curate your own play group later and then play like it better and you're able to much more manage the circumstances upon which you're playing and make sure that you're going to have the most fun in playing it choosing what scripts that your you know your play group's going to play or whatever like that um because i feel like i'm also spoiled the sydney group is really good and really relaxed and has obviously access to some of the best storytellers because that's where the, the game was made right and i don't want people in the place that that don't have access to that to like walk into it blunder through something hate it because they didn't know what was going on they didn't understand what was happening the storyteller wasn't adequately warned or prepared to help them through this or whatever and it, and they hated it because that would suck but anyway that that is enough of a rant from me long-term um player storyteller critic <laughs> complainer um of blood on the clock tower um but i really do recommend that you do check it out and i really do recommend that you put yourself in the best best circumstances to enjoy your first game so that you don't feel turned off from something because you didn't give it the the best chance of, of falling in love with it right anyway i do make a lot of other blood on the clock tower content on this channel as well as a lot of other generic board game stuff uh, and i also make board games so if you want to check out some of that stuff, I've got buttons here. They're, they're really easy to, to click on. I hold my fingers up so when I do the editing, I know when to put the buttons there. <laughs> but anyway, you could also click this button. Wait, no, it's over here. This button, this one, it says subscribe. And when you click that button, it, it makes me happy. 